Uh, the, this is an informational webinar called Outreach to Individuals with Low Literacy Skills. This session is being hosted by RTI International and is sponsored by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. My name is Stephanie Kassam. I'm at RTI International, and I'll be your facilitator for today. Tamika Evans from RTI is the event host. We have three wonderful speakers to describe first the principles and then the practice of outreach to individuals with low literacy skills. Today's session will feature speakers from two organizations and should take approximately one hour. Before we begin, I would like to invite Kathy Cope from CMS to say a word of welcome. Um, hi, this is Kathy Cope, and I'm Technical Director for the CHIPRA and ACA grants, and I'm delighted to join RTI on this call today. Um, RTI has been our wonderful partner since the very first CHIPRA grants, the Cycle 1 grants, so they've done such great work for us, and I'm just delighted they could offer this seminar today with great speakers. So I look with great interest on your um, the results of the poll, and um, so I really encourage you, you know, any issues that you have, please contact your project officer. Or you can always contact me, Kathy Cope at cms.hhs.gov. Um, and for those on the line um, um, that aren't grantees, I'm happy to help you as well. But I just look forward to this webinar, and thanks for joining us today for another fine effort from RTI. Okay. Um, Stephanie? Thanks so much, Kathy. Okay. So CMS asked us to host a session on the topic of outreach to individuals with low literacy skills because we know that many people in the U.S. have low health literacy. Health literacy is defined as the ability to obtain, process, understand, and communicate about health-related information needed to make informed health decisions. The National Assessment of Adult Literacy Sur Survey, conducted in 2003, was the first large-scale attempt to measure health literacy in U.S. adults. And this survey found that 14% of adults scored as having below basic health literacy and 22% scored as having only basic health literacy. So we know that health literacy is, in particular is an issue affecting many people, including those eligible for Medicaid and CHIP. We also know that low health literacy contributes to disparities in enrollment and health insurance. We hope today's speakers will help you all overcome barriers to health insurance enrollment posed by low literacy and low health literacy in your communities. Um, I am now going to turn the presentation over to Trina Stevens. Trina is a communications professional at RTI International with more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare field. Ms. Stevens works with diverse audiences, including patients and community-based organizations, to build and deliver public awareness programs on health issues. Her background includes integrated marketing, public and media relations, social marketing, partnership development, community-based outreach, and patient advocacy. Ms. Stevens brings previous experience developing outreach strategies to introduce Peach Care for Kids, Georgia's children's health insurance program, to eligible families. More recently, she has tailored communication approaches to reach individuals with low literacy skills for the Children's Health After the Storms, or CHAT, study. Trina, I will now hand it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Good. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time today. As Stephanie stated, I'll be speaking about strength strengthening outreach to individuals with low literacy skills. We'll begin uh, by discussing some of the application concerns of adults with low literacy. Okay. Here we see just a few of the challenges faced by adults with low or limited literacy skills. They include materials where the reading level is too high, language barriers for those whose primary language is not English, the complexity of the application itself, lack of documentation, Competing priorities and limited time, which can be a particular challenge. Um, it can be hard to feel like applying for health insurance is a priority when resources are strained and the child is otherwise healthy. A uh, parent's attention may be focused on struggling to make rent, providing food, or paying utilities and daycare bills. Also, misperceptions and fears, and this includes concerns about immigration status, being looked down upon by others, etc., and poor and or insufficient support. There was a study by the George Washington University Center for Health Policy Research that showed that 2,000 applicants who were confused by eligibility rules were nearly two times less likely to apply for Medicaid services. So providing information in a clear language, uh, plain, clear plain language, relatable and understandable way is critical to helping people understand and go through the application process. All right, now 
Some of the most common concerns about applying for Medicaid and CHIP programs are presented here and include such concerns as, is this going to be a hassle? Even something that sounds simple, like gathering all the documentation needed to apply can be enough to discourage some. Similarly, if a person has applied previously and been turned down, they may feel disheartened, angry, and sometimes feel like trying again is just a setup for another failure. Uh, the length of time it takes to apply and how long will it take before they know if they're approved. And also the ability to successfully navigate the system is sometimes a, a very big challenge. People are typically focused on applying in the hope that they'll be approved, but once approved, navigating the complexities of the healthcare system can become an even bigger challenge. And this is particularly true for low or limited literacy individuals and those who've never had health insurance before. Understanding co-payments and why they have to pay when they have insurance now, pre-authorizations, referrals, in-plan versus out-of-plan costs, et cetera, can all feel very overwhelming. And all of these are real concerns of people applying for Medicaid or CHIP. So how do you begin to identify people with low literacy skills? Um, it can be a challenge, and the two main reasons are People with low literacy skills have developed coping strategies that help hide their condition. Excuses for not reading or writing such as, I left my glasses at home, can you sign in for me? Or I'm going to take this home and read it and fill it out there. Or even my handwriting is so much like a doctor's, it would just be better if you fill it out for me. These are just some of the kinds of excuses used by people with low literacy skills in hopes of masking their condition. There was a study in the journal Patient Education and Counseling that showed that two-thirds of adults who admitted having reading problems had never told their spouse, and 19% had never told anyone. They lived their lives becoming adept at masking it and covering so successfully that even those closest to them didn't really grasp the magnitude of their struggle if they were even aware of it. And this made me think of years ago, I, I volunteered with the Literacy Project Teaching Adults to Read, and my first meeting with the man I was assigned to work with was at the local library. Um, he chose the location, and when I got there, initially I thought he hadn't arrived. I saw a man who appeared to be in his late 40s or early 50s, dressed as he said he'd be dressed, but the man was holding a newspaper and just seemed to be so engrossed in it. He was turning the pages and chuckling to himself at different articles. And so after walking around the third time, I was just about to pass him again, and he saw me, put the paper down, and introduced himself. He was the person I was there to help uh, improve his reading skills, and his reading level was barely first grade. However, he developed the skill to feel accepted and to feel like he appeared to fit in uh, with the world around him when it came to reading and writing. And the second main challenge to identifying people with low literacy skills is that many adults with low literacy or low English proficiency don't see themselves as even having a problem. They view their skills as adequate and feel they're able to get by. They don't see themselves as poor readers or really having a problem of any significance. Now, I'd like to take a moment and ask you a question. Please see the open poll at the lower right part of your screen. The question this poll asks is, do you feel confident recognizing someone with low literacy skills? This poll will be open for another 30 seconds so we can get your yes, no responses. Thanks so much, Trina. We're going to take, this is Stephanie again, we're going to take a couple minutes because we have quite a number of people filling out the poll. Okay. All right, I'm going to close the poll and show the responses. In a moment. Um, and I can see the early results. It does look like um, quite a number of people, uh, more than half, do do feel confident that they can recognize someone with low literacy skills. Um, less than 20% say no, and a, about a third are unsure. So that gives us a good sense of everyone in the room. Yeah. I'll turn it back over to you, Trina. Okay. All right, well, 
So what we wanted to do was just look at a few clues to help those who um, aren't completely sure, those maybe that aren't uh, that really say no to the poll, um, help you recognize some signs of low literacy. So people with low literacy skills will sometimes avoid looking at or only glance at written material placed in front of them. They'll often offer excuses for not completing applications or needing assistance, and this brings up some of the masking strategies that I'd mentioned previously that they've developed over time, such as forgetting my eyeglasses or I did something to my wrist, can you write for me? You may notice also that an applicant is reading one word at a time. Most people can scan text quickly and then interpret it just as quickly. But the effort to read one word at a time can drain cognitive resources and leave the person with little reserve to actually understand what they've just read. They also tend to take things literally and may not realize that the stories or examples they read are illustrating a point that actually applies to them. Uh, this may be something you'll need to reiterate to make sure that the person you're working with understands it, uh, particularly when using an example that illustrates their own situation. Sometimes an individual with low literacy skills may avoid reading altogether. If the words don't look familiar or easy to sound out and understand, uh, oops, I'm sorry, actually I jumped just slightly ahead. Let me just back up one moment here. Okay, yes. So um, if the words don't look familiar or easy to sound out, a person with low literacy skills may decide it's just not worth their time to attempt reading it and this critical information that they need. Um, and satisficing is a word that means satisfy and suffice, putting the two together. And what this means for people with low literacy skills is, is that sometimes uh, they'll practice satisficing when they're figuring out how much is enough when reading, how much information they feel is enough. They tend to stop reading as soon as they've found the first plausible answer to what they're looking for, even if it's not the best or the correct answer. And then lastly, people with low literacy skills often spend so much of their effort trying to read and comprehend what they're reading that their recall ability is lower than those with stronger literacy skills. People with adequate uh, literacy skills can retain seven independent chunks of information in the short term on average, while people with low literacy skills typically retain five or fewer chunks of information. And you can often see this when asking a person to repeat what you've just gone over. There's usually a visible struggle to recall more than four or five pieces of information that you've presented, and they may reach a point where the person apologizes and looks to you for assistance in, in helping recall the information. So it's important not to present too much information so as not to overwhelm them. Okay. So on this next slide, what we see is there was a study by the San Francisco Department of Health that found that one question can more accurately predict a person as having low or moderate health literacy skills. And the question is, how confident are you in filling out medical forms? What they found is that people who answer between one and three, not at all, a little, and somewhat, are more likely to have low or moderate health literacy skills. So you might consider asking this question as you sit down and begin the process of walking an applicant through the application. It can give you a good sense of who may need additional support to understand and complete the application. So what do people with low literacy skills need to know when applying for Medicaid and CHIP? They need to know that their family's welfare matters and that their welfare matters. Um, are they just another application or do we really see the person standing before us? They're usually facing the challenges of raising a family on a limited income, sometimes working two or three jobs. Uh, and taking the time with people with low literacy skills and showing you care makes a huge difference. In addition, helping where you can to address competing concerns can often free them up to focus on the Medicaid and SHIP application process. Years ago, I used to organize citywide immunization fairs and related events, and one of the challenges I found almost immediately was getting parents uh, who were struggling financially to see immunizations for diseases their children didn't have as a priority. So one of the things I began to do was, in addition to having our healthcare team there, I also invited the telephone company, the gas and electric company, the housing authority, and local employers so that the immunization fair became a one-stop shop for addressing a variety of needs and providing parents with the opportunity to make contact 
with people who could help in person. And I found that it made a huge difference. Parents told other parents, and we got lots of comments of appreciation. People felt cared for, and our immunization rate significantly increased. Also, how people need to know how Medicaid and CHIP can make life easier. For example, these programs will help you in providing for your children's health care needs and preventing and treating any problems that arise early. People need to know how much time it will take to apply and how difficult the process is. And again, will it be another frustrating experience? Um, and then how long will it be before they'll know they're approved? They'll also want to know how CHIP will benefit their family and need to have important benefits presented simply, such as how much will it cost to see a doctor now, and having CHIP will help them manage chronic problems like asthma and allergies. It's also important for them to understand, too, that they'll have a regular doctor now who will know what their child's medical history is, which will make a huge difference in their child's care. And next, we're going to run through just a few tips uh, when working with low literacy people and uh, completing the application. Most important is to make the application process as easy as possible. Speak in a conversational tone as if talking with a friend. Focus on what they need to know or do, but remember not to overload them with information. We want to be an application tour guide, which means introducing the applicant to the application itself so that they know what to expect and where you're taking them. For example, you can say the first part of the application asks about basic information such as your name and address and then move on. Um, remember to stick to one section of the application at a time before moving to the next section, ask questions, recap, and then introduce the next section. And then finally, don't rush. When people feel rushed, they often feel dismissed and it's as if you don't care. They'll decide not to ask important questions and for people with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency, They'll often decide not to ask about things they didn't catch and don't understand, even though when you ask if they understood or if you ask uh, did they, you know, do they have any questions, they may assure you that they don't and that they've understood everything you said. On written materials, use plain language and make it look easy to read by using lots of white space using one or two syllable words and headings that provide visual cues about the content. Sit with them when filling out the application. Don't stand or lean over the person and ask questions as you go. Does this sound like something you'd be interested in and what's your biggest concern? And then after completing the application, let them know what's next, what to expect, and when. Where can they go if they have questions later? And who will help them navigate the system if they are approved? And then finally, we're going to go through just a couple of tips for strengthening the literacy of outreach materials. So on outreach materials, we want to keep your messages short. Again, no more than three to five sentences per paragraph. Focus on what people need to know or do. We want to avoid using all caps and whenever possible, illustrate words with images and avoid statistics. Instead of saying 80% of those who apply for CHIP are approved, for instance, we want to say 8 out of 10 people and better yet, show it with an illustration. And then photographs are the best illustrators of text. They reflect real life events people and emotions, and it's easier for your audience to understand and identify with photos. However, it's important whenever possible to make sure that the audience can see themselves in the photos. And by this I mean, do the people in the photos reflect your audience? Do you see similar family scenes, show people in similar professions, and then similar neighborhood settings? And then lastly, I'd like to walk through just a couple of examples to illustrate what I've just mentioned. Okay, so this first uh, graphic uh, is actually a poster. Um, and let me just scroll down a little bit here. And this was a, a poster uh, about HIV awareness. Um, and what you can see in the picture, go back to the top, is you can see lots of white space. Um, and there are a few uh, 
skip the text in here to distract the reader. You see the doctor uh, dressed, and you can tell who he is by the white coat and the stethoscope. The image is, is realistic and shows the setting of a, a local health clinic. Let's scroll down just a bit here. Um, and very important, the message is easy to understand and is action-oriented. It's a question of health. The action uh, activity is talk to your doctor about getting tested for HIV today. The text is in a simple font and large enough to, to read from a distance. Um, and there are really only one or two syllable words used throughout. And in the second and the last example, okay, this is a poster from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And one of the things I had mentioned was making sure to use um, illustrations, photos, to, to illustrate your text so that even if you weren't able to read it very well, um, and this is particularly important for people with low literacy skills, from the pictures you can get a sense of what the message is. And this was from an E. coli outbreak and just a health alert that was put out. And so you see uh, the image that there's you know, stomach pain and diarrhea problems, so you need to see the doctor right away. Uh, that this affects both children and seniors in the second picture. Um, and then a healthy young man. So if you ate raw spinach more than five days ago, you don't need to go see the doctor. And then the demonstration of hand washing with the message at the end, protect yourself and your family. And again, there's lots of white space used throughout. Um, and just four simple images with four simple messages and the main message at the end, protect yourself and your family. So these are just two of the examples um, of what low literacy materials uh, can look like and hopefully can be helpful to you in designing your own. And that's actually all that I have for my portion of the presentation. So I want to thank you very much for your time. And I'll now return the program to Stephanie. Thanks so much, Trina. And I want to remind everybody that if you haven't already, please submit questions via the Q&A window, and we'll try to get, as many, um, get to as many questions as we can. So and I think we will, in the interest of time, just go right to our next speakers and, um, and address some of the questions um, when we, uh, at the end of the uh, both presentations. So we have another polling question for you, in fact. Um, and this question asks, do you, are, do you currently conduct outreach to populations with limited English proficiency? And while we're getting those responses, I'm going to introduce our two speakers from Public Health Solutions, a Connecting Kids to Coverage outreach grantee that's putting the ideas that Trina introduced uh, into their work. Uh, Priscilla DeJesus is the Program Manager for the Connecting Kids to Coverage Program at Public Health Solutions. She is responsible for implementing the program and managing the program's certified application counselors and community health workers who serve the target North Queens communities, North Queens, New York, that is. With her expertise, the Connecting Kids to Coverage Program has successfully uh, developed a formal outreach and education plan to reach eligible families and children and help them enroll. She is a New York State Certified Application Counselor. Hajar Shalkat is our second uh, speaker, and she is the Senior Program Coordinator for the Access to Health and Food Benefits Program at Public Health Solutions. With a background in community health education and public health, she plays a lead role in coordinating Public Health Solutions' Health Insurance Navigator Program in New York City and Long Island, including overseeing systems to collect and track data, as well as establishing a social media presence. And our poll has just closed, and I'm going to show the, the um, results in just a minute. Uh, as you can see, we have about three quarters of our uh, folks in the audience who are conducting outreach to populations with limited English proficiency. So, um, Hajar and Priscilla, I, I'll turn the presentation over to you now, and um, and it looks like we've got a lot of people who will be very interested in hearing your strategies. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear us, Stephanie? Yes, I can. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And I just wanted to first say thank you to the RTI International and 
CMS teams for giving us the opportunity to present today and for focusing on the key issue of engaging and serving individuals and families with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency. I did want to start with a brief introduction about public health solutions and the work that we do. So Public Health Solutions, or PHS, is a nonprofit public health institute that's been serving New Yorkers for 57 years. Our mission is to implement innovative, cost-effective, and population-based public and community health programs. We conduct research that provides insight on public health issues and provides services to other non-for-profit organizations to address public health challenges. We've served 80,000 individuals every year through our direct service programs, which include prenatal care, family planning, nutrition counseling services, which we provide through our WIC program, um, health insurance enrollment assistance, and food stamps benefit application assistance. So the vast majority of the people we serve are low-income women, infants, and children who live in some of the highest need neighborhoods in the city. Uh, Public Health Solutions has been providing health insurance application assistance for over 10 years. And our Health Insurance Navigator Program serves New York City's five boroughs, Long Island, and Northern New Jersey. And it's funded by the New York State Department of Health and CMS. Uh, our CMS Connecting Kids to Coverage team consists of a bilingual program manager, three certified application counselors, and six community health workers, all of whom are native Spanish speakers. Um, our Connecting Kids to Coverage program focuses on bridging health coverage disparities in Northern Queens by reaching out to subgroups of children that exhibit lower than average health coverage rates. In this case, we're focusing on Hispanic families and children. So in these neighborhoods, a large proportion of the population have low literacy skills and speak Spanish as their native language. We've used a successful model um, where we collate, where we co-locate our navigators at locations where clients go for other activities and services to assist with the with applying for health insurance. Use our, using this model, our navigators are hosted on a regular basis by other trusted community-based organizations and programs like youth centers, community colleges, WIC centers, and consulates. So, for example. Um, we currently host a navigator at Elm Corps, which is pictured here, um, and that is a local recreation, education, and social service center that serves East Elmhurst and Corona, which are two areas or two communities um, within our target zone. This approach of embedding assistance at partner sites helps us meet clients where they are in the community, and it helps us really get to know their concerns and needs so that we can adjust our approach to best provide services. So I just want to take a moment to give some background and context about our target communities. So over, we have over 400,000 people that live in our target communities in Northern Queens, and over 50% of them speak Spanish at home. A large proportion of people in these neighborhoods are born outside of the United States. Uh, many originate from Latin American countries, particularly Mexico and Ecuador. And this slide just gives you an idea of the proportion of the population originating from these two countries. So as you can see, from the dark shading in Corona, Elmhurst, and Jackson Heights, uh, a large number of people in our target communities were born in Mexico or Ecuador. So when you're looking at, particularly looking at Corona, um, which is the darkest, darkest spot um, under, in residents born in Mexico, uh, you can see that at least 15,000 residents were born in Mexico, and another 10,000 or more were born in Ecuador. So, well, actually, however, focusing just on the country of origin or language is not enough. And we found that through our workshops, uh, outreach, and enrollment, effort, enrollment efforts, that many members of our target communities have low literacy, literacy skills regardless of if they speak English or Spanish. And our outreach and enrollment strategy was developed and continues to be adapted with this point in mind. So now I'll ha actually hand it over to Priscilla to discuss our outreach approach in more detail. Thank you, Hazar. I'll now be turning to some of the specifics of our strategies. 
Today we'll be reviewing some of our key strategies for engaging people with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency. We'll be discussing what we learned during the process of implementing these strategies and some exciting new initiatives we'll be implementing soon. On a whole, our outreach strategy supports a comprehensive approach to reaching the low literacy and limited English proficiency target population. Some of the key elements that the comprehensive approach of that comprehensive approach include outreach materials, back to school and other campaigns, one-to-one -one community health worker education, our social media and target marketing. And I'll review these, I'll review each of these approaches in more detail. The goal of these strategies is to support our clients and the community to be able to understand the benefits of health insurance and the various options that they have. We hope to empower individuals to make health care insurance decisions and to take advantage of the benefits for which they are el eligible for. First, we would like to touch a bit on our written material, outreach material, and flyers that we currently use. We've generally used materials made, by, made available by Connecting Kids to Coverage program in our state marketplace called the New York State of Health. These materials include the customized Connecting Kids to Coverage flyer, which are customized to our program. We also use the New York State of Health flyers and material, specifically those that are tailored to special populations like immigrants and young adults. And finally, we use our Public Health Solutions flyer that was developed in-house. All materials are written in plain language, are available both in English and Spanish, and are customized with Public Health Solutions contact information, and leave the client with a call to action so they know how to reach us. We learned very early on to tailor our message based on what we know about our audience and how we would be delivering the message. It's important to recognize that many audiences will include a mix of people with varying literacy and English proficiency levels. What we learn is that it's not just what is written on the page, but how the message is delivered. So in general, our outreach is tailored to the audience. When approaching a community-based organization, we use more of a formal approach, sharing more program information and written material. When leading workshops, particularly with parent-teacher associations, our approach is informal. We found that PowerPoint and other formal presentations are not effective in engaging this type of audience. Instead, we tailor the presentation on the spot based on the questions from the audience members. When conducting community-based outreach and canvassing, our approach is informal, and we use it as an opportunity to engage community members. And finally, when providing one-to-one -on -one -on -one education, we take a client's lead on the most pressing issues and questions to address. Most importantly, at the end to one of our one-to-one -on -one session, whether during outreach or enrollment system, we make sure that the client understands what we cover during that session. We do this by using the, the teach back tech method and asking clients to briefly explain what they understand their next steps will be. We've tailored all our material based on feedback from individuals and families that we serve and continue to evaluate the effectiveness. As I mentioned, even with the best written outreach material, it's a challenge to deliver a clear and consistent message about health insurance options, especially during the last year when so many messages about health insurance and the Affordable Care Act were being disseminated. Health information can overwhelm even people with advanced literacy skills. As Trina mentioned, individuals with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency face multiple challenges. Based on our experience, some of the most important elements of delivering a clear and consistent message include having staff on board who speak different dialects of Spanish. The Hispanic population in our target communities originate from many countries in Central and South America and the Caribbean. Though they all speak Spanish, there are some differences in dialects, and we benefit from the diversity in our staff who speak multiple Spanish dialects since it makes our clients more comfortable. Another key element is to be careful with the word density on a page. Because of the high level of information that we need to convey, we complement the written material by providing one-to-one -one education. This allows us to present information in a format that is easier to understand to the consumer. We have, expected clients, we have experienced clients being overwhelmed by the information because there's too much words on the page. We also focus on brand recognition. I think this has been probably been a challenge for many grantees, both who are using states, serving states and have state-based marketplace or federal facilitated marketplace. 
It's important to a client to know to where to find the online marketplace and uh, application assistance. We recognize our consumers may be confused to what services we provide because we use three different flyers for the same program. However, we make sure to be consistent with our branding and all outreach by including a PHS logo on all material, including social media. Our staff also works hard at debunking misconceptions about health coverage. The poll question that was presented earlier at the beginning of our session about the biggest literacy barrier was a great one. At the launch of our program, we probably would have answered it differently, but we realized early on that the most frequent misconception our staff encounters is the question of Obamacare being a type of health insurance. Many clients come in saying, I need to apply for Obamacare, when in reality is that they already are covered through Medicaid. Finding ways to teach clients about basics of the law re requirements has been essential for us. Similarly, another common misunderstanding among consumers is that we that we serve is the difference between Medicaid program and the managed care plans offered under Medicaid. One-to-one -one sessions have been most effective in addressing this misconception. For our target population, alleviating concerns about immigration status has been has become our biggest concern. As many of you know, as many you know, fear, confusion misinformation about applying and receiving public benefits often deter immigrant families from seeking coverage. We address these concerns at the onset of working with the client to make sure this does not serve as a barrier to apply. In our efforts to build on current work, in the coming months, we'll be launching our back to school campaign using many of the tips offered by CMS and the Connecting Kids to Coverage program. Over the past year, we built some key partnership with parent-teacher coordinators and, communi and community-based organizations that work with groups of schools to build foundation for, the campaign, for our campaign. The plan is to disseminate material and educate community in three simple steps, to make sure that we drive the message home and provide on-site opportunities for parents to ask questions and complete applications. We identify 10 schools through our canvassing efforts and our partner collaborations. The first step in September is providing each student with a customized back-to-school connecting kids to coverage flyer. During the months of September and October, our community health workers will be posted at designated school exit dismissals to promote the Affordable Care Act workshop for the upcoming PTA meetings. And finally, through November, our community health workers will facilitate Affordable Care Act workshops at the schools. Immediately after the workshops, the community health workers will complete an eligibility screener and our set appointments for our navigators. As Hazard mentioned earlier, our navigators are hosted in locations where clients go for services and activities. To learn more about our community members, where our community members congregate and go for services, we have implemented an outreach mapping project using Google Maps Engine. Google Maps Engine provides an interactive map with real-time data and updates on a shared drive that can be accessed and updated by all our staff. If you look at the upper left-hand corner of this slide, you can see six venues or layers of outreach efforts, and they focus on schools and daycares, community-based organizations, faith-based institutions, medical facilities, immigration and tax services, and recreational facilities. This current view is a snapshot of our schools and daycare layer, which is represented by orange icons. To view details, we simply click on the icon and a call-out box with detailed information appears, including the number and types of material we distributed. We use our maps to visualize our outreach efforts and identify where, the, where to reach people with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency. Now I'll turn it back to Hazard to describe our community health worker approach. Thank you, Priscilla. So one of our most recently launched initiatives is bringing on board community health workers. And this has been a key step in expanding and enhancing our reach in the community. By bringing on community health workers, we've actually um, had, we've been able to have more foot soldiers in the field and implementing the strategy that Priscilla just discussed. Um, so each community health worker possesses key traits to facilitate their work within the community particularly with people with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency. 
So our main goal is to ensure that community health workers speak the same language as our community members, both literally and figuratively. So when bringing community health workers on board, we're cognizant of the individual's country of origin, their familiarity with the Northern Queens community, and their past experiences with obtaining health coverage and accessing care. So many of the community health workers that we have on board are immigrants who've had to navigate the healthcare system for themselves and their families. And as Trina mentioned, this makes them well positioned to provide reassurance and address concerns. We also consider many, or any community health worker training that this individual may have had, and all of our community, well, community health workers have completed formal community health worker training since we reached out to local community colleges to provide a pipeline of eligible candidates. And we found that all of these characteristics put the community health workers in a prime position to meet individuals and families where they are and establish a trusted presence in the community. So remember that we said before that the, the method of delivering the method is, or delivering the message is crucial. So in addition to expanding our outreach efforts on the ground, we will also be using social media, radio, and websites to engage our target audience. So in terms of our social media strategy, we've brought on community health worker, we've brought on a community health worker whose primary focus is to establish our Facebook site. And research has shown that many Hispanics regularly access the internet for social media purposes. So given the makeup of our target audience, Facebook is, is expected to be a key tool for reaching these community members and facilitating their understanding about health insurance. And not only will the messaging on our Facebook page be tailored for people with low literacy skills, but so will the content. So the page will be used as an additional interface to interact with the community to introduce our navigators, share our consumer stories, uh, ask trivia about how to get health insurance, and promote videos that explain the Affordable Care Act and health insurance in simpler terms. Uh, additionally, given that our target population mainly consists of Spanish speakers, our online and radio campaign will be done using Univision. So this campaign will not only be delivered in the primary language of many of the individuals and families we serve, but it will also be use, using a method of delivery that is familiar to them. So using Univision as our media platform allows for us, or will allow for us to present our messages using a trusted source in the community. So as, we were, as we've reviewed today, there are actually many ways to engage tar target populations and clients, particularly those with low literacy skills and limited English proficiency. Most importantly, we found that investment in engaging with community members on a one-to-one -one basis has helped us adapt our approaches uh, as we work to most effectively reach eligible families. And at this time, I'd like to thank you again for listening, and I will turn it back to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Hazar and Priscilla. That is really informative, and we've gotten a lot of comments that it's it's a lot to take in. So I appreciate um, both you all and Trina um, for presenting such rich information. For the question and answer period, I'm going to start with a question that I want to pose to both to, to all three of you. So the first question we have is, uh, how do you deal with a situation when you are doing a presentation and workshop to a group with mixed levels of literacy skills and English proficiency? You had mentioned that you do do that, but uh, I would like to hear first from Trina and then from Hajar and Priscilla what tips you have for, for doing that. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, when I've done that, I've, I've focused it on keeping the material still uh, for a lower literacy uh, level audience. Um, and what I found is that it, the material is, when it's presented for an audience with lower or limited literacy skills, um, it's still just as useful for those with more adequate literacy skills. Um, in today's world where there is such a desire to have information presented quickly and in a simple, easy to grasp, format, the low literacy principles really works for any audience. 
Um, and, and it provides us with an opportunity to reach everyone simply, quickly, with information that uses those principles of uh, one, two simple syllable words, um, you know, lots of white space, pictures to illustrate text, etc. Um, and it provides everyone with what they need as a takeaway. And for those with more adequate literacy skills who have uh, additional questions, usually we just do fine taking those questions either at the time or sometimes people will come up afterwards. And uh, those who would like additional information, we're able to provide it. But that's the, the way that we usually go is to just focus on the low literacy uh, level presentation, which seems to work for everyone. Thanks. Uh, Priscilla and Hajar, what would you say? When it comes to presentations, uh, as we mentioned before, we don't use PowerPoint, but we start our presentation by engaging the knowledge of what the, the participants know already. So we'll go into a presentation and ask if they know what Obamacare is. So we want to know where they're at so we can tailor the presentation. Um, we do conduct our presentations both in English and Spanish. And we provide the material, the outreach material at the end so we can provide on one-to-one -one, uh, basis for the clients. Thank you. So, so picking up on that, um, the fact that you said that you asked people first what Obamacare is, one comment that we received is that one of the literacy-related barriers that folks out there are, are facing is trying to explain the concept of insurance in general and how to use insurance and what, um, what it means to have in health insurance. Is that something that you, Priscilla and Hajar, have addressed head on in some of your presentations? And you could give us some tips on, and then I'll ask Trina as well. But starting with Hajar and Priscilla. Oh, are you all there? Well, community health workers, uh, when they do outreach, we do get a lot of questions of what services we provide. So they do the breakdown of what um, the Affordable Care Act is, and then they break down the insurances, especially for our clients and our population, is breaking down what Medicaid is versus the managed care plan. So we do give that background to our consumers. Great. And uh, Trina, is there, uh, do you have any tips on, on explaining health insurance and, and how to use it? I would, I think I would reiterate um, what Heather uh, has had to say. Um, I think just try, trying to present it most simply, and sometimes it's helpful to have information, and I think most people do now, and just you know a couple of bullets with some illustrations if possible, but a, a bulleted form um, that has four or five major points that people will need to know, um, and almost present sort of a map of, of what it is, what it means, um, and defines some of the terms like co-payments and, and answers questions simply. Um, because I know that you know a lot of people feel that when they haven't had insurance before and they get it, that things like co-pays are sometimes an unpleasant surprise. Um, and just other terms that are that we use pretty commonly, but if you are new to insurance, it becomes just a, a jumble of terms and a mystery. So I think sometimes just having simple documents that hit the major points and then having a place where people can go back to, whether it's the outreach worker or, um, or another contact where if they have questions, they can go back and ask additional questions and get some help navigating the system um, is, is what I would suggest. Thank you. Yeah, we had a specific follow-up question about that, about how to explain certain health terms like deductible and copay. Um, and if there are any good resources that either of, that any of you know about um, to, to define those in simple terms, um, it looks, sounds like this group would be really interested in hearing about that. Another set of questions that we've gotten from a number of people. Oh, I want to pause there. Is, did, did anyone want to say more about how to define those terms related to health insurance? Uh, this is Trina. I've seen um, one or two uh, good resources, and what I can do is get that to you, Stephanie, and, and perhaps we can get that out to the participants. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. 
So another set of questions we've had is related to how to use Google Maps Engine, which um, I think a number of people were, were, were interested in seeing. So Hajar and Priscilla, thank you so much for providing the link in the chat window. If everybody has not seen that already, there's a, a link to this Google tool. Uh, do you want to talk about how you discovered this tool and um, how you began to use it and, and what you're using it now for? We discovered Google Maps Engine when we were looking at our target zone and dividing our zones for our community health workers to provide outreach. And the service was, we, we paid for the service, and you have a basic one for free, and then the one you pay for, you can create layers. So there are different categories. And the category that you saw on the slide that I had was schools and daycares. However, you can add up multiple categories, and we chose to only have six categories that our community health workers were focused on. And on that view, you only had schools, but if you were to click on all of them, you're able to, and it works as a spreadsheet. So all the information, when we do canvassing, we come back to the office, we apply it to a spreadsheet, and then when we click on a layer, let's say the schools and daycares, we open it, we import all the information from our spreadsheet and it automatically will populate like you see on the screen. And then once you click on the, in, on the actual icon, you will see the call-out box that comes up and you can edit that information if you like on individually basis or on the spreadsheet. But you have to take some time and play with it and know what you're going for. And all those layers that you do, uh, not layers, but the actual map itself and all the borders were created by hand, I mean with mouse. All right, that's really interesting. Okay. There are tutorials, though. If you do go on the website uh, of the link that we provided, there are tutorials. There are many tutorials that you can base your maps on. Great, great. So another question for you at Public Health Solutions um, came in through the Q&A. And the question is, is anyone focusing on informing male head of households in the Spanish community since they make the final decisions? That's the question as worded. Um, it, do you want to comment on if you do specific outreach to male heads of households? Our experience is that most uh, the applicants are mostly women. Um, yeah, even in affairs and events when we're doing outreach, the women are mostly the ones that approach us and make the decisions for, for their families. Although we do engage everyone where we're canvassing, or if there is a male that comes in, um, we, we obviously take the application. But mostly what we've seen is the females make, coming in and conduct, um, filling out the application. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of comments here from people who want to offer resources about explaining health insurance terms. So one um, says that, a good a resource is uh, the CMS Coverage to Care Roadmap, and you can order those brochures for free. Another one says that the Medicaid Managed Care Plans uh, have glossaries um, and glossary ex explanation of terms that are written specifically for members um, at lower literacy levels, and you can uh, see some good examples at CENCAL health.org, and uh, I'll try to post that in the chat window as well, uh, those examples. So uh, and we have a, a number of people who, ha who are interested in seeing the examples, Trina, that you posted earlier, and uh, as, as, as examples of using um, pictures and text to explain certain concepts. Trina, can you comment on uh, perhaps other websites that might be a good examples for that, um, using that technique of pairing text and pictures? Um, oh, Trina, are you what, Yes, I'm sorry. Um, what I have to do, let me, let me uh, look back at, uh, there are several, and let me um, pull up a couple of them. I don't have them handy in front of me at the moment, but let me pull up several others, and I can I can maybe even post that while we're talking. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Thank you. So um, are there any other questions that people are about um, ready to type? So someone asked to put the uh, the web addresses in the chat feature. So I'm going to try to do that right now. And um, 
thank you to the participant who offered these up. Um, at this moment, I haven't seen any additional questions come in through the Q&A, and we are about at the top of the hour. So what I want to do now is thank everyone for joining today's session, and especially Trina, Hajar, Priscilla, and then Kathy from CMS for sharing um, sharing insights with us and, and your warm welcome. Uh, thanks to CMS for making this session possible too. Connecting Kids to Coverage will continue holding more web-based events later this fall. And if you're not al already on their mailing list, you can see a link that we're about to post um, on, on how to join that mailing list. And before we close, I would like to make a plea to please complete the evaluation form that pops up on your screen after you close out of this session because we're really interested in your feedback on today's session and we'll use it to plan future events. I'm going to post one more link here that another, um, another person has suggested to, um, to get uh, to, to find more uh, low literacy level uh, materials to explain health insurance terms. So um, again, thanks everyone for your interest and time today, and uh, we really appreciate it, and good luck out there. Thanks very much.